In this episode of Detroit Performs, a painter finds her calling with a unique artist tool. Jazz inspires a man to paint. And a painter's portfolio captures a simpler time. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm your host, DJ Oliver, and today I'm at the Northville Gallery, which features a collection of beautiful artworks that would suit just about anyone's taste. I really love these pieces behind me, which just happen to be made by our first artist, Emily Beadle. Let's check out how Emily uses an interesting technique to create this style of painting. The feeling I have when I'm painting, time goes by without me noticing. It's kind of like a break from reality and yet I'm doing something productive with my time. I've always had an interest and love of art and I experimented throughout my life. It wasn't until a few years ago I was living in Hawaii and that's when I really started again. I moved to a town in Kauai and they had a big art night every Friday night and one of the artists there, Giorgio Naranjo, does the palette knife paintings and I had never seen it or even heard of it before and I instantly loved it and was really drawn to it because of the texture and the vibrant colors that he used. And um, we ended up becoming friends and he helped me get started and gave me some guidance. And after doing that a few times, I actually started some work on my own. And then quickly after that, I moved back to Michigan and that's really where I developed my own style. I love everything about using a palette knife. I think it's really the only reason I'm pursuing art at this point because without it I wouldn't have a direction. I love it for many reasons. One, because it gives the painting so much texture and it allows me to really layer the paint and it also, I think it's a great tool for adding movement into the painting. My process really starts with this collection of ideas and experiences that I've had and usually when an idea comes to me, I, I just go with it. Nature in general is really my main you know, subject matter. One thing just ends up naturally leading to something else without me planning on it necessarily. For example, in Kauai, they have a tree tunnel where eucalyptus trees have grown together at the top, literally forming a tunnel. And I did some paintings of that and that kind of evolved into these other tree tunnel paintings I've done more based on Michigan landscapes with um, more birch trees or whatnot that you see here. And it's been really fun because I feel like I'm taking a collection of experiences I've had in my life and places I've seen and kind of collaging it together to make this series. And sometimes I change the color scheme to depict winter or fall or summer or add some kind of a sunrise into it. I think in today's world it can be really depressing to listen to the news and see things that are going on around us that's very chaotic and upsetting. So I feel like using nature as my subject it just kind of makes me step back and appreciate the small things and see the beauties around us and not just get caught up and let it pass by. I'm working on this new series of sunflowers where I incorporate the squares background behind the sunflowers and the squares is kind of my signature style. It's um, kind of a pixelated look but the squares are arranged like very precisely and purposefully. With the sunflowers there is three to four layers of paint for each petal and most areas of the paintings will have that three to four layers of paint and then I will go through with a knife later and blend some of them or sometimes I carve through them to blend it that way. 
So I just added the centers into the sunflowers and now I'm kind of blending the edges where the petals meet the center and this would be um, in nature where the seeds would be in the sunflower. And this is kind of fun because this is um, doing a little bit of carving with a knife. It takes two weeks to a month to dry depending on the thickness of the paint. My husband Corey is extremely supportive with my art and he actually makes all of the frames and stretches all of the canvas for me, which is really a huge part of the whole process. I'll put in the corner supports. This really helps because as uh, the paintings are drying, um, paint dries at different times, especially with her sunflowers. Um, I always use this because like her sunflower petals may not dry and they'll be up here, but the, the rest of it's gonna dry so it starts twisting the wood a little bit. So this helps prevent that and keeps it nice and, nice and square. My art is shown really throughout Michigan right now. It can be found at River's Edge Gallery, which is located in Wyandotte, also at Northville Gallery in Northville. And previously I've shown my work at the Tangent Gallery and Start Gallery in Detroit, also the Museum of New Art, um, which is called Mona, and that's in Troy. I have public art in a few different cities right now. Um, I have work in Royal Oak, Novi, Romulus, and Michigan City. My piece in Royal Oak is a reproduction and it's outside on the Royal Motor Inn, which is facing East 11 Mile. I have had people say to me that my paintings seem calming to them. I hope it kind of gives them the same feeling it does for me of like that step back from the chaos. And one way that my husband puts it that I really like is he talks about how my paintings are like in today's world basically of how everything is HD and perfect and it's whatnot. It's kind of nice to have something that's like real and it has the texture to it and it's not perfect and it's just beautiful to look at. You can learn more about Emily Vito on DetroitPerforms.org. 25 years ago, John Osler got away from a high-pressure advertising career to follow his passion, photographing and painting jazz people. Well, I love photographing and uh, then painting musicians in action, but uh, for me, those quiet moments when they are in thought and uh, really uh, so involved in the music, maybe it's somebody else's music, I think that's magical and it sort of tells me a lot about the music. Like this is Bradford Marcellus at the Jazz Festival here in Detroit uh, at a quiet moment when he was listening to someone else play and deep into it. I really appreciate that type of thing and I, that's what I'm trying to accomplish is show the musician and the music. I guess I can't separate the person that plays the jazz and the jazz. There's no jazz unless you have someone, a, a thinking person, who's uh, adventurous and, uh, and yet grounded. And I, that's just fascinating to me. And I learned so much probably listening to them talk to each other. Uh, that, that's the greatest pleasure I have, is when they get together and share stories and laughs. And uh, that's a good time. That's a, that's a rich experience. It's, it is jazz when they talk <laughs> to me. That, when we hear the music, that's the result of what goes on behind the scenes. A photograph is, is, um, is a process. You're recording something in front of you. You have to put yourself in front of that. And, uh, that's the job, and then uh, and you are you put the camera up, and you're behind, you lose yourself because the camera is in front of you. I love that part of it, losing myself behind the camera, because if people aren't looking at you, they're looking at the camera. It emboldens you to walk in and get in front of people and do things. Um, I really appreciate John. He's always a, around uh, us. Uh, he's there to capture, to try to really capture the spirit of what we do. Um, and I think that really shows in the photographs that he takes of us, uh, the poses, the lighting, 
um, uh, the other kind of reflective looks often musicians have that he's able to capture because he's really paying attention and really trying to get inside of what we do. And I really love him for that. I had a chance to go down and uh, travel around in the south, went into a little town in Jonestown, Miss Mississippi, and met these remarkable people. They had very little. Uh, they took me in. They talk, they, I found truth with these people. Uh, just, uh, they knew how to laugh. Uh, they listened, they looked at you when they talked, and you felt you were, you know, it, it changed my life. No, I, I decided I was in a place where I could move on with my life, and, uh, and my dream was always just to paint. I, I can't describe the experience of painting. I, I can get so frustrated, and I can fail so many times in a row. I could spend a week doing nothing but painting and failing. But the process of working at it, all of a sudden, it comes through, and all of a sudden, it's a miracle. And it's better than you ever could expect you could do. This is a woman uh, who is in her 70s, late 70s, maybe she was 80 years old. But she came in with this great dignity, this uh, idea that uh, she was beautiful. Uh, it, was, it was an awesome thing. I would give her a ride home. She was living downtown in uh, some senior housing. And she told me her story that she had been a dancer at the Cotton Club in its heyday in, in Harlem. Uh, I'm holding the uh, first sketch I did for the Jazz Festival poster for last year. Uh, it is a generic guy, not a real person, although I was uh, used some reference from I had of jazz players. I just want to show the, uh, it, it should have color to be a poster and I wanted to, to show some strength of the musicians and so I just had them blowing. And uh, you can see uh, it's, it's loose. I had to leave a little room, put the, the copy to let you know it's a festival. Well, sometimes you get in what they call the zone, and you can't do anything wrong. And it's so easy, and everything is magically. You can use the wrong brush, and you get a little piece of that brush, hits the canvas, and it's perfect. And that's the same thing with their music, but it takes a lot of stuff to get that point where you, you get in that zone. And when you get two or three of those guys in the zone together, and they enter and they play off each other, and you happen to be there, because it's probably never gonna happen in recordings, do you? If you happen to be in there, that's the reason you go to jazz clubs. Be there that, that evening. And you know it because you can see the joy in their faces afterwards. They knew they did something. The same thing is, with a painting, you have it afterwards. There it is, the canvas. It's done, so other people can share it. You can find out more about John Osler and all the artists featured here today on DetroitPerforms.org. Now, let's check out some upcoming events happening in and around the D. To discover more events in Greater Detroit, visit ICSITY.com. The paintings of artist George Kovash are of another place in time. Still, whatever Kovash chooses to paint, his landscape seems so real, the viewers may feel as if they could step right into the scene.
every painting I do, I can see that I can do it better. It challenged me to go on and create and try different things. My name is George Kovac, and I am a fine artist. I do every kind of conceivable art there is. I do Santa Clauses, I do nostalgia, I do a lot of landscapes. I uh, do everything i challenged with. I've always enjoyed art as a kid. I like to draw and paint and, and that. I just uh, was fortunate where I live in Texas that um, art was selling and uh, so I stepped out of my job as a, a law enforcement and uh, started painting full time back in 1972. So uh, it's been a long career and uh, I've got quite a large body of work out there. My landscapes, uh, you don't have to please anybody but yourself. That's what I like about landscapes. And a tree is a tree, you know. So I kind of balance my life with painting for myself, which is landscapes, and then painting other things, uh, commissions for other people. In Texas, I do a lot of Texas Hill Country paintings. That, that takes care of that side of me. Up here, I do a lot of nostalgic things, and, and I enjoy that immensely, too, because it's, it's such a diversion from, from just plain landscapes, and that's, I can build on houses and scenes like that. It, it uh, reminds me of my growing up days. Uh, I grew up on a farm in Ohio and then moved to Florida, so I, I've seen both the north and the south, and so um, I draw on my um, experiences as, as a kid. A lot of that is uh, imagined. I'll, I'll see something, um, I might sketch it there on location or I'll take photographs, but I like to take a piece here, a piece there, and then build my own town and uh, just create my own world, in fact. It's just two different worlds I play in, fine art and kind of commercial art, too. The painting uh, is titled Treasured Times, and it is a, a compilation of different scenes that I've seen. I've got a building that I actually saw in, in uh, Georgetown, north of uh, Austin, Texas. I really was inspired by that. And I used that as uh, one of the main buildings in the painting. I set it back into the 1950s. So I used models of a Ford and a Chevrolet, the popular cars then. And then I put the, the theater in there and, and the gimbals and pennies and a lot of things that we recognize from uh, the days back in the 50s and 60s. There's uh, the Marcus uh, Theater, which is a really uh, noted spot in, in Milwaukee in this area. The final thing was put the boy and the little dog and the birds in, and which just kind of completed the whole picture. All that uh, will bring back a lot of memories. I start with small little thumbnail sketches. And then normally I'll just take a canvas and I'll just start right off the bat. I'll, I'll draw it in. If it's a building, I usually draw that in first. On my landscapes, it's a little different situation. I just go directly with brush and paint and start painting. But uh, when you do detail, you want to be correct. So I use photographs and uh, I just use all the tools that uh, I muster up to get these things into the right perspective and such. I'll probably do an underpainting of acrylic, and which doesn't harm the painting or anything, and then I, I paint oil over the top of that. So that's just kind of the process I've been used to all these years, and it's, it's worked well for me. If you get up close, it looks like Impressionism, <laughs> but uh, I like to make it look as real as possible, but yet still, I, I, I'm not too crazy about making it look like a photograph. I want the, the person to see that, that I have my own personality in my painting. I wish they could get that uh, warm feeling like back in the 50s and the 60s, how times are a little bit slower then, and uh, get a nice feeling. That shouldn't be your main goal, is to sell your work. It's, you should be doing, you should be painting uh, to satisfy your creativity. I just paint for myself, and, and if I satisfy myself, then that's, that's fine with me. <laughs>
You can learn more about George Kovash on the Detroit Reforms website. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Reforms. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitReforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to thank the Northfield Gallery for having us out here today. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.